That sound is a shockwave, created when something travels faster than the speed of sound. And only one car has ever gone that fast, the Thrust SSC, which hit 763 miles per hour back in 1997, over 25 years ago. It's exactly 50 years since the sound barrier was first broken in the air, but no one has travelled at the speed of sound on the surface of the earth until now. And just think about that speed for a second. At 763 miles per hour, you could drive from New York to LA in under four hours and still have time for lunch. But now engineers are trying something even more incredible. They want to push past 1000 miles per hour on the ground. So to understand why this is such a massive challenge, I spoke to to Dr. Ben Evans, a professor in aerospace engineering who worked on the only car that's ever officially gone supersonic. And what he told me changed how I think about speed itself. Because at these speeds, we're heading into the unknown. Parts of the car go supersonic while others don't, creating shock waves that interact in ways that we still can't fully predict. And the most surprising part? Well, the sound barrier isn't even the biggest problem. So let me show you why breaking 1000 miles per hour is one of the greatest engineering challenges in history and why it might be impossible. At over 301 miles per hour. 370.75 miles an hour. 403 miles an hour. 600 miles an hour. World land speed record. And well, what we want to do is set the world land speed record. It means the British team have a new supersonic world land speed record to their names. So let me put this speed into perspective. The fastest production car in the world tops out at an incredible 300 miles an hour. And a Formula 1 car, about 220. And even at those speeds, the air resistance is already so intense that it feels like trying to push through a wall. But now imagine trying to go nearly five times faster than an F1 car. And we're talking about speeds that fighter jets reach, except they're in clean, thin air miles above the earth. Whereas land speed record vehicles are trying to do it just inches off the ground. And that creates a whole set of problems. To set a land speed record, you need to make two runs in opposite directions within an hour. And that sounds simple enough, but at these speeds, you're not just fighting against drag. You're creating shockwaves so powerful that they can literally tear up the ground beneath you. There's enough energy in the airflow around that vehicle to lift it off the ground if we got it wrong. And then what happens when you push through sonic speeds into like, this supersonic regime and the strength and the, the shock waves strengthen. I mean, ultimately it comes down to this simple force balance. Are you gonna have enough thrust to overcome the drag? But before we can understand how to break 1000 miles per hour, we need to look at something even more fundamental. What happens when a car tries to move faster than sound itself? When we push a car faster and faster through the air, we enter what's called different speed regimes, and each one brings its own set of challenges. Let's start with what's called subsonic. That's anything below Mach 0.8, or around 600 miles per hour. And this is where most vehicles operate, from commercial aircraft all the way down to your family car. But as we approach the speed of sound, that's 7 767 miles per hour at 20 degrees Celsius, something fascinating happens. We enter what's called the transonic regime, and this is where things get a bit weird. So of course, as you approach sonic speeds, the speed of sound, there will be parcels of air that start traveling at supersonic speeds relative to the vehicle before the vehicle itself is traveling at a supersonic speed. And when once you're past that point, you're into yeah what, what we call the transonic regime. For any vehicle that's moving at a non-stationary speed, there are the, the, the air has to accelerate around the vehicle to be able to pass around it, to create that space that the vehicle needs to push through the air. And there will always be parcels of air that are traveling faster that the vehicle is traveling. Just think about that for a second. Parts of your car are already breaking the sand barrier, while others haven't yet. Because of the shape of the car and the aerodynamics, the air is literally moving faster than sound in some places and slower in others. And in many ways, that's the kind of trickiest bit because that's where you've got such a, a weird mix of things happening. You've got subsonic flow, you've got supersonic flow. 
you've got shock waves forming, but they've not yet stabilized, so they they typically are quite unstable systems. Push past Mach 1 faster than sound itself, and you're into the supersonic regime. This is where the thrust SSC made history, becoming the first and only car to break the sound barrier. But going from 763 to 1000 miles per hour isn't just about adding more power. It's about crossing nearly 250 miles an hour of completely unknown territory. It will be the biggest single vehicle leap in the land speed record that has ever happened in absolute and percentage terms. And here's what makes the jump so challenging. At these speeds, the shock waves you create are incredibly strong and will make the car unstable and significantly damage the surface it's driving on. We're literally pushing into physics that no land vehicle has ever experienced. So to understand why braking 1000 miles per hour is so difficult, we need to look at what happens when a car first approaches the speed of sound, because this is where the air starts fighting back in ways you might not expect. When a normal car drives down the road, it pushes the air molecules out of the way. And these molecules get an early warning that something's coming, like ripples spreading out ahead of a boat. But as you get faster and faster, those air molecules have less and less time to move out of the way. And at the critical Mach number, around 540 miles per hour, parts of the airflow become supersonic before the car does, creating the first shock waves and marking the start of the trickiest phase. This is the speed where the airflow around the car has started to go sonic or supersonic even before the vehicle itself has because the air, some of the air is accelerating around the vehicle. Now, from that point on, some quite weird, interesting stuff happens aerodynamically that most ground-based vehicles don't have to worry about like shockwaves. So think about what's happening here. The car is moving so fast that the air molecules directly in front have no idea it's coming. There's no warning ripple, no time to move out of the way. Instead, they get suddenly compressed together, creating powerful shockwaves. Speaking of pressure, you know what else can cause unwanted compression? Multi-blade razors. They compress and tug at your facial hair, often cutting below the skin surface. That's why two thirds of men expect irritation when shaving. Pretty wild when you think about it. We're still dealing with razor burn in 2025. And that's where Henson Shaving comes in. They've engineered a precision razor that works with your skin, not against it. Using aerospace grade aluminium and a single sharp blade, it cuts hair at skin level without the tugging and irritation of multi-blade razors. Meaning my skin has less irritation and is softer since switching to Henson's. What really impressed me is how they've approached this from an engineering perspective. The blade exposure and gap are precisely controlled to provide consistent cutting without damaging your skin's protective barrier. Plus, the blades cost just pennies to replace. So if you want to experience a better shave, head to hensonshaving.com forward slash driver61 and use code driver61 to get 100 free blades with your razor purchase. That's literally enough blades for your first two years of shaving. Now, back to those shockwaves. And these shockwaves are strong, strong enough to actually change how the car behaves. There's enough energy in the airflow around that vehicle to lift it off the ground if we got it wrong. Um, and then what happens when you push through sonic speeds into like, the supersonic regime and the strength and the, the shockwaves strengthen? For land speed record cars, the first shock system appears at around Mach 0.7. That's about 540 miles per hour and it typically shows up in the last place that you might expect, underneath the rear suspension. At these speeds, the air is accelerating around the curves of the car so fast that it creates pockets of supersonic airflow, while the rest of the car is still subsonic. And these sudden transitions between subsonic and supersonic flow create incredibly unstable conditions. And all of those features are happening in, you know, in a fairly yeah, localized way, but also in a, in a, particularly the shocks that appear underneath the vehicle are very transient. They'll, you know, they'll first appear in one position, but then as the car accelerates, they'll rapidly move down the vehicle. And to add further complexity, unlike an aeroplane that can cruise steadily at these speeds, a land speed record car is always either accelerating or decelerating. This means those shock waves are constantly shifting position, creating dramatic changes in the forces on the vehicle. 
But these shockwaves aren't just affecting the car, they create something else. That distinctive boom you hear when something breaks the sand barrier. And this is where things get interesting, because what I understood about sonic booms wasn't actually quite right. Most people think a sonic boom is just a single loud sound that happens when something breaks the sand barrier. But that's not quite right. So it is a big deal, but I think the fact that we, for all sorts of historical reasons, have called it the sound barrier, have perhaps placed too much uh, emphasis on the idea that it's this almost like this impossible thing to do, right? Um, do, you know, does anything fundamentally change when you go from like Mac 0.999 to Mac 1.001? Well, not really. And the sound barrier itself isn't even really a barrier at all. To understand what's really happening, we need to look at how sound normally travels through the air. As I mentioned, when a regular car drives down the road, it creates sound waves that travel ahead of it, warning the air that something's coming. So a convention F1 car, the, you know, cars that you and I will drive today, right? They're creating sound waves, pressure waves, which propagate at the speed of sound. And essentially what these sound waves are doing in simple terms, is giving the air that's up the road ahead of the vehicle some advance warning that something's coming. But when it's going faster than sound itself, the air ahead has no idea it's coming until it's too late. Once the vehicle itself is traveling at or above the speed that those waves, those sound waves can travel at, so it's at supersonic speed, that information can't propagate upstream to give advance warning to those air molecules. So what a shockwave is, in essence, are these parcels of air that have had no advance warning that something is coming, suddenly having to kind of pressurize, be squeezed to create the space for the, for, the, for the vehicle to pass through. Okay, so all of that makes sense, but here's the bit that I hadn't quite grasped. The boom isn't something that happens once you break the sand barrier. It's happening continuously as long as you're moving faster than sound. It's when that shock wave, which kind of then propagates out into, into space, passes the ear of a human on the ground, that's when you hear, you know, what sounds a bit like a thunderbolt or a, or a sonic boom. Right? So it's not the sound of the vehicle going through the sound barrier, it's just the sound of a vehicle that's traveling faster than the speed of sound. But for a land speed record car, there is another problem. Those shockwaves aren't just moving through the air like they would do with a plane, they're actually interacting with the ground itself. Essentially, that, that bow shock that the car is pulling with it from its nose, I mean, it really, it did so much damage to the Soviet. I mean, initially it compresses the floor down and then behind the shock sits this expansion that really kind of sucks the surface up off the ground. And so the result is that at supersonic speeds the shock waves are so strong they're digging up the surface beneath the car. The rear wheels of the thrust SSC weren't even running on solid ground. They were essentially running through a cloud of loose desert surface. And that was at 700 miles per hour. At 1000 miles per hour, these effects would be even more extreme. So how do you actually design a car to handle these incredible speeds and forces? Well, the answer lies with aerodynamics in every curve and angle of the vehicle shape. So let's start at the front. You want a pointy nose. It's crucial for managing those powerful shock waves we talked about earlier. Like a blade cutting through air, it's designed to create the smallest possible disturbance. It's pointy um, because that's how you minimize shock strength once you're at supersonic speed. Shock strength is related to how much you're asking the flow to deflect, like what angle you're asking the flow to turn through. So by making the nose pointy as possible, what you're asking of the air to do is you're minimizing that change in direction. But it's at the back of the car where things get really interesting. One philosophy for design is that the rear wheels need to be positioned as far out as possible, which might seem strange until you realize why. At these speeds, the wheels create about a third of the car's total drag. And that's a huge amount for such a small part of the vehicle. Now, the engineers would love to hide the wheels inside the body, but it's likely that they can't. They need the wheels to be out wide to keep the car stable as it moves across the desert surface. And for added stability, you're going to need to design a massive fin. It's the same principle as throwing a dart. The fins at the back keep the pointy end facing forward. 
But at these speeds, even this creates a problem. The bigger the fin, in theory, the more directionally stable the car becomes, the more it just naturally wants to point forward. But the downside of that is the more sensitive it becomes to kind of crosswind gusts, right? So there's this balance between inherent directional stability built into the vehicle and, you know, on the day you are going to get some kind of crosswinds um, and the bigger the tail, the more it will respond to those crosswinds. The entire underside of the car needs to be a masterpiece of engineering, carefully shaped to direct those powerful shockwaves upwards away from the ground while impacting the body of the car as little as possible. So why is it almost impossible to break 1000 miles per hour on land? It's not the sand barrier, we've already broken that. It's not even the technology. We know how to build engines powerful enough to reach these speeds. And it's not really the aerodynamics, that's all been calculated. The real problem? Well, that's finding somewhere to do it. Somewhere long enough, somewhere wide enough, and somewhere with the right surface. There aren't that many left is the truth. On a supersonic run, you wouldn't then be able to run back on that exact same line because along that line, you will have damaged the surface. You'll move across, step across, and run back on a slightly different line. You need about four and a bit miles to accelerate from zero to a thousand miles an hour. And that's accelerating at about three G. Um, and then of course, you've got, you've got the problem at that point then. <laughs> at that speed, you're covering a mile about every three seconds. And in five miles, <laughs> there's something to crash into. At one end, you've got a road. At the other end, there's a mountain, effectively. So breaking 1,000 miles per hour isn't impossible, but it does require everything to be perfect. The engineering, the location, and even the weather. And one small mistake at these speeds isn't just a failed record attempt. It could be catastrophic. Now, if you like the idea of breaking a thousand miles per hour, check out this absolutely wild story about this crazy Australian trying to do just that. It is incredible. Thank you so much for watching and please consider subscribing as it helps me convince people like Ben that it's worth giving up their time to speak with us. Cheers and I'll see you next time.